Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blockworks Macro YouTube channel. This is your weekly video that will cover my free newsletter, The Macro Compass. And the latest article was about the pension fund drama. And I want to start with one quote from the great Hyman Minsky that said that stability leads to instability and the more stable things become and the longer things are stable, the more unstable they will be when the crisis hits. Now, recently, there have been some crucial developments in the global pension fund industry, particularly in the UK one. But to give you some context first, we're talking about a $40 trillion industry here. And years and years of lower rates, subdued cross-asset volatility, led pension funds to make more aggressive use of derivatives, mostly but not only for edging purposes. And as derivatives require little cash investment up front, this freed up additional capacity to invest the cash in higher yielding assets that were necessary to generate better returns. After all, if you know returns are so low elsewhere and volatility is so low, why not use this strategy? Well, as the perfect storm is hitting markets right now, we are finding out about the why not part. So this article aims at breaking down what's really happening in the UK pension fund drama, but most importantly in, in the global pension fund industry, and discuss whether a similar episode could also hit the European or the US pension fund industry, and what the implications for markets and portfolios could be. Now, let's start with some context first, guys. The size of the global pension fund industry is estimated to be in the 35 to $40 trillion area. It's really a large market, but it's also a systematically important industry, not only because of its size, but also because of its social impact. I mean, after all, after years of hard work, we all look forward to some pension. Now, we recently got some headlines from the UK. Pension funds were about to blow up and the Bank of England had to backstop them by effectively limiting the rise in 30-year yields. Let's try and understand how this episode of acute stress actually realized um, in details. Now, first, what are pension funds? What do they do? Pension funds are in the business of accumulating premiums today and investing them such that they will be able to pay out pensions in the future. So from a balance sheet perspective, you can think of pension funds liabilities as a promise to pay a stream of retirement cash flows in the far future, generally 20 to 30 years ahead. And these organically exposes them to interest rate risks because the discounted value, the market value of these liabilities goes up if rates go down and vice versa. Now, the, the problem is that to guarantee solvency, these risks, these interest rate risks need to be hedged, at least to a certain extent, but funds have to generate returns too. So if you think of their asset side, we talked about the liabilities, if you think of their asset side, their asset side must be a mix of assets that are there to generate returns and investments that are there to hedge the interest rate risk we just discussed about. Now, let's talk about the hedging part first. Now, if you have long dated liabilities, a good way, a natural way to hedge those will be to buy a long dated government bond. There will be an obvious candidate as an asset to have in order to hedge this long dated interest rate risk. And that's correct, but as yields were moving lower for a decade, that meant that pension funds, together with hedging this interest rate risk, were also locking in pretty low interest rates and low yielding products by buying these government bonds. And that's why a more convenient instrument became increasingly popular. That's swaps. So an interest rate swap, a receiver interest rate swap, is nothing else than an agreement to receive cash flows at a fixed rate that we decide today, and we will receive cash flows uh, in the future at that fixed rate. We will pay cash flows on the, on the other end at the prevailing floating rate over time. So basically, you are exchanging a, a stream of floating cash flows for locking in a stream of future fixed cash flows. Now, Good, but where is the trick? Why would somebody use swaps to hedge interest rate rather than government bonds? And the beauty of a swap is that there is basically no principal investment up front, only a very, very little initial margin to be put up front. Also, those derivatives are mostly cleared through a clearing house, which requires this initial margin that we just discussed, and then variation margins to basically cover your mark to market movements throughout the lifetime of the transaction. But the initial margin is really small, and that means that the cash that would have been invested in long dated safe bonds, in these government bonds, now when you use a swap to hedge your interest rate risk, the remaining cash, which is very large, can be deployed in higher yielding investments. 
which in a low return environment were vital for pension funds to deliver the returns that are necessary to service pension payouts in the future. And swaps became so popular, and together with other um, factors, basically, uh, swap rates over the long end, 20 to 30 year swap rates now yield way below government bonds. So they traded a premium to government bonds because they're so popular and so convenient for this kind of operations. Now, let's recap. From the hedging perspective, pension funds are sitting on a very large amount of these 30 year swaps that they use mostly to hedge long dated liabilities. This requires very little upfront cash investment, which means the remaining cash can be directed towards higher expected return assets. Stocks, emerging markets, credits, um, uh, real estate, whatever. This all works when volatility is very low, but at a certain point, this happened. And this is what you see in this chart, which is a massive drawdown in third-year bond yields in the UK, which was spurred by, first of all, the inflation spike, and second of all, the mini-budget from UK politicians that basically was fiscal spending on top of a raging inflation problem already. Now, institutional investors, risk models, and trust me from first-hand experience, are generally based on a 5 to 10 year historical volatility. Now, you see that chart, and when the volatility is so much higher, that means that investors are unprepared to deal with such moves. And the amount of cash required to meet the variation margin, the margin calls basically, when the move in interest rates is so big, 6 to 8 times a standard deviation compared to the past 10 years, are extremely, extremely big. And the models, the risk models that were used to calculate uh, and to stress this potential margin calls, were obviously unprepared for such a big move. Also, remember, where was this cash invested? This cash was mostly invested in riskier assets that Clearinghouse will not accept as collateral. Now, one of the ways to meet margin calls is to take your assets, post them as collateral, get funding, and use that cash to meet the margin call without having to fire sale your entire asset book. Pension funds cannot go to a clearing gas with their remaining assets because they're too risky and won't be accepted as collateral. And also, they do not have access to the central bank directly, which makes it impossible for them to just post even good collateral to the central bank and receive the funds to meet the margin calls this way. Now, if you are facing a liquidity call, but you cannot raise liquidity, you are in the most typical liquidity constraint problem. And the only way out at that point is to literally liquidate your assets, bonds, stocks, everything, and meet the margin calls to make sure that that liquidity problem doesn't morph into a solvency problem. Now, what assets do you sell first? You sell government bonds. And the reason why, it's because they're very liquid and the, and the market can theoretically swallow large sales. But those large sales end up compounding the problem. Think about it. Rates are going up. You have to meet margin calls on your swaps. You end up selling your government bonds, which means you make rates rise even further. And the market makers who are supposed to warehouse your risk, your bonds, your sales, have been crippled by regulation and are unable and unwilling to help you with that process, which means a domino-like, a vicious circle unfolds where those fire sales end up compounding the problem. And at that point, the central bank is forced to step in and to stop the bleeding by effectively purchasing as many long-end bonds as necessary to limit the cascading risk. Now, we just described a huge, systematically important sector like the pension fund industry effectively experiencing an acute liquidity crisis on the verge of morphing into a solvency crisis. That's quite some serious stuff. So the real question here is, can this happen in Europe or in the US, for example? And before we answer that question, we need to remember that the UK pension fund industry has a lot of idiosyncratic features that compounded the issue, and in particular two. The first is that a lot of assets uh, in pension schemes in the UK is in so-called defined benefits pension schemes. Almost two trillion worth is in defined, pension, uh, defined, defined benefit pension schemes. Those are basically pension schemes that have promised to deliver a certain stream of cash flows to pensioners and therefore required pension funds to make more extensive use of derivatives and return-seeking strategies. And the second is that the pension fund industry in the UK is literally gigantic, both compared to the size of its economy, 120% of GDP, wow, and also to the size of the underlying high-quality bond market. So if you want to know how your country pension fund industry is ranking as a percentage of GDP, this OECD table comes in very handy. You can see some interesting numbers in there. The UK is not the only jurisdictions with humongous pension fund industry, Take the Netherlands, for instance, at over 200% of GDP, 
Now, should the Dutch or the Europeans be worried about it? And my answer is yes and no. So they should be worried about it, yes, for mainly two reasons. The first is because even if there are some differences be between the European and the UK pension fund industry, you have to assume that a sharp move in 30-year European rates could spark some similar dynamics amongst Dutch and European pension funds too. The second is that so far we only talked about the margin calls that are relevant for interest rate swaps, but in reality pension funds also use a bunch of other derivatives, FX derivatives especially, to hedge the FX risk that is embedded in their foreign bond investments, foreign equity investments. They also use commodity derivatives, total return swaps, futures, so on and so forth. And as volatility is picking up everywhere, these margin calls theoretically could pop up also where you least expect them, not only in interest rate swaps. The reason why I think instead that uh, Europeans shouldn't worry that much, and Americans too, is because the size of the European pension fund industry as a percentage of the bond and the repo markets is much smaller than in the UK. And also the access that these pension funds can have to this pool of very liquid assets that they can sell and raise cash to meet margin calls or send out in repo is much larger, which means the magnitude of such a stress episode could be more contained in Europe and in the US. Now, a quick word about how these fire sales and this big systemic crisis can affect portfolios. And um, also a quick word about US inflation, which was released on Thursday. What I want to say is that stability breeds instability, as Hyman Minsky said. And I'm going to add on top of it that instability brings volatility and that volatility breeds more volatility. And let me try to explain. When the most liquid and deep market in the world, the bond market, experiences daily swings, which are three to five times bigger than the last decade average, it is mechanically impossible for large institutional investors to allocate capital in riskier assets. Now, a very leveraged system can only become more unstable when the very base of the pyramid, the most liquid and deep market in the world, the bond market, is so volatile. And the pension fund drama is a case in point. Now, add to that that yesterday U.S. inflation showed, the, the report, U.S. inflation report showed that core services prices, which are the stickiest component of the CPI basket, keep marching higher, even if you detrend energy and food from it. And while this is mostly due to a lagged impact of an overheating housing market in 2021, which gets now reflected in rents in 2022, the Federal Reserve will be forced to set monetary policy looking in the rearview mirror. They will keep tightening almost no matter what. Now, this means that the chance that they will end up breaking something in the meantime is very high. Will this stop them? Only if they literally freeze the repo or the treasury market in the US, we are far away from that. There is a chance they will stop if there is a big solvency problem, credit problem. Also, we haven't seen that yet. So the Federal Reserve will keep going and there is a time to go long, a time to go short and a time to go fishing. Now, as a long term investor, long only investor, because you can't go short and it's definitely not the time to be brave and go long, in my opinion, it's time to go fishing which means, generally speaking, a dollar cash allocation and an underweight in risk assets remains my preferred stance, while from a tactical macro perspective, there are many more opportunities and you can see both my trades and my performances on the macro compass. Talking about that, guys, there will be some major news coming over the next few weeks from the macro compass perspective. Stay tuned because they will be announced on the newsletter and here. Uh, also, I'll be in London next week uh, talking at the Blockworks uh, Digital Asset Summit conference and be there for a few days. So if you want to check me out, um, just, uh, just reach out via email. Uh, you can find much more information, contact info, etc. at themacrocompass.substack.com. It's, it's the written format, basically, of my free newsletter. It goes out once a week to 104,000 investors as we speak. Thanks everybody for the support you have given me over the last 10 months. It's been great and I'll keep you updating with the best possible macro analysis I can deliver. Talk to you guys next week. Bye.